lymphocytes, the cells that make antibodies, are very important in initiating inflammation in multiple sclerosis, and many of our drugs work on B cells, rituximab, ocrevus, Briumbi, Kisimta, but these drugs all deplete, in other words, kill the B cells, and they can cause consequences like low antibody levels and infections. But today, I'm going to talk about a completely new investigational drug that doesn't kill B cells, but modifies their effect, obuxelimab. And it's different from Bruton's tyrosine kinase inhibitors. This is a completely novel drug. And according to a recent press release, in a randomized trial in relapsing MS, it reduced active gadolinium-enhancing lesions by 95%. So we'll look at how this drug works and the results of early clinical trials, citations below. Obixelimab is marketed by the company Zenis Biopharma, which is a small pharmaceutical company that does not currently have any FDA-approved products. They also have in development the drug oralabrutinib, which is a Bruton's tyrosine kinase inhibitor, also an interesting product for MS, perhaps to be discussed in a separate video. Obexalimab is itself an antibody that binds to two targets. One is CD19 and the other is FC gamma receptor 2B. These are both cell surface proteins on the surface of B lymphocytes and I'll explain what they are in a moment. It is non-cytolytic. In other words, it does not destroy the B cells. It leaves them intact but changes their function. There are two formulations. One is intravenous given every two two weeks, and the other is subcutaneous given weekly. And this subcutaneous or under the skin injection weekly is the one that's being studied in MS. So it is a fairly frequent injection. It's in clinical trials for multiple sclerosis, but also lupus and a rare autoimmune disease called IgG4 related disease, where people have very elevated levels of immunoglobin G subtype four, and this can cause inflammation of the pancreas, the gastrointestinal tract, the salivary glands, and also the meninges, or the coverings of the brain. So neurologists do see people with this disease, and I have a few patients with it. This is the surface of a B cell. Here you have the cell membrane. This is the cytosol, the inside of the cell, and this is the extracellular component. And here are three cell surface proteins. This is the B cell receptor, and it is involved in receiving the antigen. So each B cell has a different B cell receptor complex, and it receives a specific antigen or target. So this could be like a piece of a protein, like the surface of a virus or a component of a bacterium, and a specific B cell receptor will bind to that antigen and then send a signal within the cell to activate it. So then it could produce antibodies which target that antigen, in other words, fighting off the virus or the bacteria. It can interact with other cells of the immune system like T cells and cause inflammation. So Obviously, this is very important in our defense against infections. And in autoimmune diseases, some B cell receptors can target self-antigen. So in multiple sclerosis, this antigen could be a component of myelin, like myelin basic protein. This cell surface protein, CD19, is kind of a co-receptor of the B cell receptor. So this is a marker of B cells. If you look at a flow cytometry reading, the CD19 count tells you how many B cells you have. CD19 is also present on some plasma blasts, which are sort of more different differentiated B cells that can turn into plasma cells and start producing a lot of antibodies. So CD19 kind of works with the B cell receptor and helps to stimulate this intracellular pathway that will stimulate activity. And so it's kind of a pro-inflammatory protein that's important in the function of the B cell receptor complex. Now, FC gamma R2B is a receptor for FC, which stands for fragment crystallizable, which is the component of the antibody that's sort of generic. It's sort of like the stem, not the component of the antibody that interacts with a specific antigen. Now, most FC receptors are pro-inflammatory. They stimulate the immune cells, but FC gamma is the opposite. It sort of regulates 
activates the immune cell, it makes it more difficult to activate the B cell receptor and the intracellular cascade. And obviously it doesn't completely stop the function of the B cells, which are very important in our immune system, but it makes it a little bit harder for antigen to stimulate the B cell receptor. So it sort of raises the threshold for B cell receptor activation. And as you'll see, this new drug binds to both CD19 and FC gamma R2B. Here's a different view. Again, we have the cell membrane and the B cell receptor interacting with the antigen, this green thing. Again, this could be like a component of a virus or perhaps a myelin protein if you have multiple sclerosis. It then initiates this intracellular cascade leading to cell proliferation and antibody production. But there's this other signal, FC gamma R2B, which interacts with the other end of the antibody, the FC component. It, and then it activates SHIP1 and SHIP2 inositol phosphatases, which then sort of interferes somewhat with this intracellular cascade, meaning it's harder for the B cell receptor to do what it's trying to do. I know you didn't come here for cell biology, but this is essentially an inhibitory or regulatory signal. And there is some evidence that FC gamma R2B does have importance in autoimmune disease. For instance, mutations in this protein have been linked to an increased risk risk of lupus and rheumatoid arthritis. There's no such data in MS. I did find this animal study. This is in experimental autoimmune encephalomyelitis, which is a mouse model of multiple sclerosis. And here on the y-axis, you're looking at the clinical score, which is the severity of the central nervous system disease. Higher score means more disabled. And on the x-axis is weeks after receiving the treatment that will initiate the autoimmune disease. And in black, are mice that are genetically engineered to not have FC gamma R2B. So they do not have this inhibitory signal and they develop more severe disease. Could the same principle apply for multiple sclerosis? So this is the normal physiology without obixalimab. You have the B cell receptor binding the antigen. Again, this could be a component of myelin, but it also binds circulating antibodies, which could then interact with FC gamma gamma R2B, and if the interaction with the B cell receptor is significant enough, it can cause activation and overwhelm the suppressing signal from FC gamma R2B. And remember that B cells, when receiving the signal, they can produce antibodies, but they can also present antigen through major histocompatibility complex class two to the T cell receptor and activate T cells. But when obixelimab is given, it cross cross-links these two proteins. So it binds both CD19 and FC gamma R2B and does two things. One, it activates this signal through FC gamma R2B, this inhibitory signal, making it harder for the B cell receptor to be activating. Also, it can interfere with the normal co-receptor function of CD19. Normally, CD19 works with the B cell receptor, and it may interact with that. And so it's sort of regulating the B cells. It's not killing them. It's not breaking them open, like with drugs such as Ocrevus, but it's turning them into zombies so they don't function normally. Here's a diagram of the pharmacokinetics with obixalimab. And so the black line is saturation of the CD19 receptor and you can see it shoots up right away and stays high for around 169 days after the last dose. So why do we have to give this drug once a week? To be honest, I'm not sure. It seems to bind the receptor for a prolonged period of time. If you look at the B cells in red, they drop down to around half normal levels, and then they slowly come back up many, many weeks later. In terms of plasma blasts, which I mentioned before, the effect is a little bit more profound. They're going down to around 10% or 20% of baseline levels, but they eventually do come back up after the drug is stopped. This is a preliminary study in healthy controls of different doses of abixalimab and what percentage of CD19 receptors are free. And you can see with a dose of five milligrams per kilogram, which is lower than the dose in the multiple sclerosis trial I'm gonna show you, which is 250 milligrams subcutaneous once weekly, the average
average person weighs more than 50 kilograms, you can see it's essentially 0% are free after three weeks. So again, it's not clear why this drug needs to be given once a week. Let's now move to the results of clinical trials so far. We'll start with IgG4 related disease. Here you can see an MRI showing impressive pachymeningeal enhancement. Of course, this disease can affect other organs as well. This is a small trial, only 15 participants, it's open label, not randomized, no blinding, done at Mass Gen Hospital. They were given five milligrams per kilogram IV every two weeks for 24 weeks, and it seemed to work. 14 out of the 15 were responders. Also, the B cells came back very quickly, recovering to 75% of baseline within 42 days of the last treatment. However, some kind of adverse event was common, mostly mild, and one person stopped treatment due to infusion reaction. Here's a phase two trial in lupus, 104 participants. They gave the same dose, five milligrams per kilogram IV every two weeks versus placebo. It was a randomized trial. And there was a trend toward better outcomes, but it was not statistically significant. So 42% receiving obexelimab did not have loss of improvement, so higher would be better, versus 28.5% with placebo, p-value of 0.183, so not impressive from their perspective because it did not achieve statistical significance. The B cells decreased only 10% the first day. Compare that to a drug such as rituximab, whereas within hours, essentially, there would be zero detectable B lymphocytes in most individuals. Same with other B cell depleting drugs drugs and they were down to 50% of baseline values by day eight. So it's not killing the cells, but it's blocking their proliferation and all cells have a limited half-life. So the levels do go down, but they come back up later on. There were side effects with infusion reactions, but it was generally considered to be safe and well tolerated. Those seven stopped treatment due to reactions. So some kind of reaction to the IV form seems to be common and lupus is a disease with many well-established therapies, so maybe people weren't really willing to continue in a clinical trial if they had any side effect. Though they reported no increase in infections compared to placebo. Here are the side effects in the same lupus trial. Nausea, headache, vomiting, back pain, dizziness, flushing, and pain in the extremities were all clearly more common than with placebo. Now let's move to multiple sclerosis. This is the Moonstone study. Now this is just from a press release, not published data. This was a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial, 116 participants with relapsing MS. They got the subcutaneous form of axillimab, 250 milligrams subcutaneously under the skin by self-injection once a week. Now, based on the pharmacokinetic data, this should essentially completely saturate the CD19 receptors in all of the B cells. I would say this is essentially as effective as this drug could be, probably giving a higher dose would do nothing, it may even be possible to give a lower dose or give it less frequently. They compared it against placebo, but they had two to one randomization. So two thirds of the participants got the drug, one third got placebo. This is what's done to try to recruit people into the trial so they have a greater chance to receive the active drug. And it was successful. There was a 95% reduction in active lesions, lesions that take up the gadolinium contrast dye at week eight and week 12. In other words, by month two and three. So pretty quickly. And the average number of lesions per scan was 0.01 with obexilimab. In other words, one lesion per 100 scans versus 0.23 with placebo, 23 lesions per 100 scans for a p-value of 0.0009. Clearly, this drug does work to suppress lesions. Now, that's not quite as effective as B-cell depleting drugs. So, for instance, Casimpta, some of the trials show 99 or 100% suppression of active lesions, 
but it's pretty good. And if it was safer, it, if it had a lower risk of infections, it would be a fairly good drug. They did not show the specific data, but new or enlarging T2 lesions were also reduced. They did report side effects such as infection, hypersensitivity, no details at the time that I'm filming this. The 24-week data, the six-month follow-up, will be released the first quarter of 2026. Here's a timeline of the other clinical trials the drug company is doing. The Indigo trial for IgG4-related disease, there may be data by the end of 2025, so maybe we'll learn something more about the safety, the risk of infections. That would be very important. And the Sunstone trial in lupus, there may be data in 2026. There is one statement on the Zenis website I disagree with. They say most B cell depleting agents are administered every six months by intravenous injection. Quote, modest B cell recovery between doses can result in loss of efficacy. I would argue that almost all observational studies go against this. They suggest there's absolutely no correlation with the level of B lymphocytes and the risk of relapses or new MRI lesions. And in fact, it's likely safe to take breaks in these drugs to allow B cells to replete to reduce the risk of low immunoglobins and infections. That's my personal opinion. It's highly controversial, but there is a lot of observational data backing that up. For instance, during the COVID-19 pandemic, when COVID was bad, people wanted to stop these drugs. They generally did okay with a low rate of relapses, also data during pregnancy and breastfeeding. A couple miscellaneous questions. Does this drug have a rebound effect? Because it doesn't kill the B cells like Ocrevus and Cassimpta, maybe if you stop taking it, you could get a rebound similar to what happens with Tysabri and S1P receptor modulators. That could be a real practical concern. One potential good thing about this drug is it may spare the regulatory B cells. So not everything the B cell does is through B cell receptor activation. There are regulatory B cells that secrete anti-inflammatory cytokines such as interleukin-10 and TGF-beta that may suppress inflammatory activity that don't require B cell receptor binding and would not be killed by this drug. Maybe that's one of the disadvantages of other B cell depleting drugs I hadn't considered. However, it's certainly possible this drug could weaken the immune system, cause low antibodies, cause serious infections, particularly with long-term use, just like with traditional B cell depleting agents, we don't really know if it's any safer, and certainly it can cause unpleasant reactions. However, if it could have a dramatically lower risk of infections than traditional B cell depleters with long-term use and be as or almost as effective, both of these statements are completely unproven by the way, it could certainly add value to the multiple sclerosis drug market and potentially help many people with the disease. All in all, I can't say I'm overly excited about this drug given the plethora of B cell depleting drugs drugs on the market. For many people with relapsing MS, the benefits of these medications are going to greatly outweigh the risk. However, there is some possibility that this new drug, Abixalimab, could be safer, and that's something to consider, and certainly a 95% reduction in active lesions without killing B cells warrants further research. Maybe the drug company would consider a phase 2B trial to look at dose finding prior to a large phase 3 study. After all, it would be terrible if we were giving people this drug once a week when it would be just as effective giving it every two or four weeks. I'd like to know what you think about this drug. Are you excited about it? Would you consider entering a further clinical trial? And let me know if you have suggestions for other videos.